Scylla, in general, is a full stack framework for Spring Boot and React. We also support the lit library uh, in addition to React in the front end. And the whole point of Hilla is to enable teams to build business applications faster, faster. And the key aspect of Hilla is that it enables you to call services, spring services directly from the front end, from say React front end. And, and that enables you to be free of the need to have duplicating or deciphering, say, GraphQL calls or REST calls, because you can directly call uh, Spring services in the backend and, of course, doing it securely because Hilla uh, relies on, integrates and relies on Spring security to ensure that only the right people have access to, to those uh, backend services. And the key aspect of Hilla is that it has this TypeScript generation for full, full stack end to end type safety. And we will have a demo by uh, Anton shortly, and he demonstrate partly that this end to end type safety, the benefits of this end to end type safety aspect of Hilla. And, and, but importantly, at, at the high level, the end to end type safety implies that you can sure, be sure that you are moving fast without breaking anything. So end-to-end -end type safety implies that if you have any changes in the back end that are inconsistent with what you have in the front end, you will be able to capture this inconsistency in development time. So you will be sure that any errors or any inconsistencies between back end and front end don't make it to production systems that your end users will not have to, to face poor quality in the application. So Hilda ensures the good quality of of the of the application it enables the full stack teams to move faster with the uh, development of business apps in addition of course the hilla comes with uh, a set of ui components optimized for uh, developing business applications specifically and it also comes with the benefit of having a C zero configuration building tool so you can it just with a one cli command you can get ready with a building a full stack application in, in seconds. And it also supports two libraries, as I mentioned, React and Lit in the front ends, and it optimizes for developers' uh, productivity. And last but not least, the name Hilla is actually a Cloudberry. It's a tasty Cloudberry that grows in the northern part of the hemisphere, including in Finland, where Anton and I are located and where uh, Vaden is uh, headquarters is located as well. And to emphasize as well, just the difference between uh, Hilla and Flow in the backend, both of them support Java. So that's that's common between both of them. The main difference is in the front end that in Hilla you have the front end, you write it in TypeScript, HTML and CSS. And when you write it with React, then that's TypeScript, React plus HTML plus CSS. Whereas for Hilla, both the backend and the front end are written in Java. Uh, one also key difference and implications of this difference is that the UI code is running in, in Flow, it runs on the server, whereas in Hilla, it's running on the browser. And as, but aside from that, all the other things are, are common between the two. Both of them include ready-made UI components, as I mentioned, that are optimized for building business apps. Uh, bo both of them offer full stack projects that get you productive in, in seconds. And uh, both of them offer end to end type safety so that you are sure that there is consistency always between the back end and the front end. And final clarification before giving the mic to Anton about the difference between Hilla plus React versus React alone. So, of course, one can use React alone as well. Uh, but Hilla, well, well, Hilla offers React and Lit as well, supports Lit, but let's say, so uh, in, in that sense, in the front end part, they are both similar. The difference is that Hilla is optimized for a Spring Boot backend, whereas React is agnostic. And this agnosticism, or actually like the, 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 the opinionated or the or the or the tight uh, integration between the back end and front end of Hilla allows allows for certain productivity gains that are not possible in React alone, and uh, these productivity gain include importantly end to end type safety, which is that for the back end models for metadata about the back end models and business logic, 
Hilla is able to generate corresponding TypeScript type definitions that ensure this end-to-end -end type safety, as I mentioned before, that ensures the consistency always between the back end and the front end, whereas React alone wouldn't provide you this. In addition to that, of course, like Hilla comes with a UI uh, set of UI components and React is again agnostic about that. You have to choose this yourself and make sure that it's working and, and consistent with the React version that you're using yourself. Hilla ensures that the whole package works, just works. And again, you have a full stack project, whereas React tends to have like this complete separation between, between the front end and the, and the back end. And also, uh, yeah, integrated build tooling in the sense that um, also that when you get, uh, again, with one command, you can get started with a full stack ready to, to run and to develop uh, uh, application project for you to, to be able to be productive in a matter of, of minutes. With that clarification, I give the mic to Anton, who will be talking to us about Hilla React Forms. That's the latest addition to our, to our uh, list of capabilities for Hilla React. And uh, yeah, take it away, Anton. OK, just a minute, I'm sharing my screen. Yes, I think I'm here. So let's focus on uh, what are the benefits of using Hilla uh, regarding forms combined with React. Uh, before getting into Hilo features, let's talk about why forms are complicated in the beginning. What, what makes them complex uh, in the UI? Because uh, from the glance of it, uh, from an outsider, from non developer's perspective, it should be really easy. There is some kind of object structure defined already for you, and you just take the fields uh, for every key or every property of this object, and then you make the UI template with all those fields and then add the submit button, and then you're done, right? But in reality, it's not quite, because then uh, in the happy path, everything works. But uh, the users might actually do more than that. The user might attempt to submit an empty form. Or the user might attempt to uh, forget. Uh, the user might forget the required field. Uh, and do other things with the input data, like setting the wrong, uh, obviously wrong date of birth that's in the future, or mis uh, forgetting to type an app character in the email field. So those things, we should ideally be able to help the user to not make those mistakes and keep the data clean. And uh, the list goes on and on. There's many errors like that that we could take into account in the UI and help the user. Um, so then we come to the form validation, which is the process of taking the user input and checking if it's correct against our predefined rules. And this process is nearly universal. It should happen for all the forms. It's very rare that you have the form that you don't need to validate at all. Like maybe just a single input search form that one example that comes to my mind, or a freeform text field, text input, text area. But otherwise, you would really need to check some, uh, to run some checks before taking the value into the database. And for those checks, uh, you cannot skip them on the server. So server side data validation is a must because uh, on the server, on the back end, you almost always have some data format requirements. Like your fields should be less than X characters long. Or well, your number should be uh, really a number and not just a string with uh, characters, random characters. And then sometimes you also need to check the data against the previously existed one. For example, check if the username is not taken or something like that. And uh, a lot of those checks cannot be disclosed to the client side, so that for security reasons they must be on the server. And we cannot trust. We can ever trust the date the client with the data. So, uh, because malicious users, attackers can tweak the client and send some arbitrary data that we are not in control of. So for security reasons, we must keep the validation on the server side. However, on the client side, we need to do some validation too, because that gives a, an optimal UI performance. If we are able to check the thing on the client, there's no point of pinging the server with a round trip, and we can give the user feedback right away. 
And another layer of complexity is that next uh, UI designer comes and asks, hey, could you please show this error when you, from the server next to the field and not elsewhere? So then, we, then this brings the whole logic about parsing the server errors and assigning them to their respective field locations. And in the end, you have a complicated UI template where for every form field, you do lots of things. You set the initial value. You read back the updated value from it. You check if the value is valid against uh, some number of rules. And if some rule is broken, then you show the error message about this rule. And then you submit it to the server. And then the server might actually respond, hey, there is another error. So you show the errors from the server again. That's quite a lot. Uh, so here's how Hila helps with, with that. If you use Hila with React, we now have in Hila 2.2 the new package, Hila React Form. And the benefits of using that for your form binder is that it's going to integrate your form smoothly with Hila endpoints and take the value, propagate, it, uh, propagate the errors from the server for you, and uh, take care of the end to end type safety and uh, uh, all those regular endpoint benefits from Hila. Uh, on top of that, we also support the validation on the client side using the same JFF free beam validation that you would probably want to use on in Java on the server side as well. So we are kind of optimizing and, and we are able to give the user feedback early, but the, the rules are shared with the server. So there's a lot less, uh, less to do for the developer in order to implement that. The API surface is really simple. It's built around React hooks and it exposes two hooks. Uh, I'm going to focus on use form for now. And use form part is its uh, smaller brother for the subform components. Uh, the use form hook is manages the state of the form. It, it takes care of the validation. It takes care of the submission. Um, and uh, you can customize the validators and whatnot with it. And it also gives you the field directive that you can use to, to simplify the templates in the UI a lot. You, would, you can get down to just basically one line for every component in the UI template. And here's also the documentation link where you can check all the details and find the usage guides. Uh, briefly, the, uh, just a few steps on how to put it into use. Uh, your journey would start from a Java form backend. There's, uh, no matter what you use, you could use JPA for storing your data. You can use a, a service layer uh, of some sort. But anyway, um, uh, in Java, you're going to have some data definition, some DTO, or some real database entity, and some kind of a service that works with it and allows for the client side to retrieve and to save. In this example, there's a person entity, and there's some kind of a sign up form. Uh, with a person profile details like name, an email, email, and so on. And uh, once you have your person service defined on the backend and the person entity defined in Java, he will generate the accessors for you for TypeScript. Uh, you can call the methods from the person service using the person ser service uh, endpoint, as we call it, Ac accessors. And then Hilo will also generate the person model definitions. This is something that not only declares the type of the person, but also encapsulates metadata about uh, what kind of validations are defined on the field, what kind of what is their type, so that uh, so that you would be able to skip all that in the front end template and just say exactly that I'm going to use this field from the database with text field in the UI that has the label full name. This is the basic structure of it. Now let's see in action how it works. So here I have a little application. Let's uh, uh, start from the backend. I have the person entity. And uh, in my Java entities, I have skipped from de declaring uh, getters and setters because I'm lazy. And I'm, with Hila, I can, I can get away with only Java fields. Um, and uh, here I 
the, here's the structure for the person entity. It has a string name, email, and I use some validation annotations here so that my backend will check that this email has a good format. And all of the fields have nominal because uh, obviously it should have some value, even though an empty string. But anyway, not the not Java null is allowed. And then email should not be blank, name should not be blank. So those are required fields uh, all the time. And date of birth should be in, in past, obviously. Um, my service is really simplistic. I use the hard coded data to load, and uh, I do not do anything to save the person because I assume that the database will handle it for me and uh, will not throw any errors. But that's enough for the client side. And here's my person form in React. Uh, I use the use form right away. And this person model is generated by Hila for me from my Java entity. It has all the rules. It knows how to validate uh, the name and the email. Um, it knows about the data of every field. And uh, when I give it to my use form hook, I have the model instance in the result object. And with this model instance and with that field magic function, I can combine them with in the field templates and, uh, and say that this text field is a field that corresponds to name in my model, in my data model. Yes, besides the person model, I also give it a callback to submit. I said that on whenever submission happens, I want to call the save person endpoint in Java like so. And I give it the uh, uh, entity data. And once this call succeeds, I just display the uh, notification here. And for our developer convenience, I serialize the JSON just to see uh, what was indeed transferred to the server without the opening developer tools here. Here's my UI template. Uh, yeah, uh, it's really straightforward. Uh, some classes, some uh, style sprinkled pop up, but in the essence, it's just a field with a name and the corresponding uh, binding to the model. And that's it. Oh, yeah, of course, I have the submit button. And on click, it does something that is called submit, where I get the submit, I get it from the use form. So, use form provides the uh, click handler for my submit button conveniently. Uh, Let's see, let's try to submit the form and see what happens here. Oh, I was denied from submission and it says that my my name must not be blank. Sure, uh, that was a client-side validation, I suppose. So let's give some name and I uh, can I submit again. Well, something happens, but I cannot see anything. Let's check the error pop up here. OK, I have validation errors in the form. And there is one error that I'm completely missing because it's about email, and it must not be blank. And why do I not see it in the form? Oh, of course, because I don't have the place to display the error message. I, I have forgot to add the email field in my form. Let's fix it right away. Um, I'm going to be lazy, and I'm just going, going to copy an existing text field and rename the label. Let's name it email. And then I need to bind it to something for my model. Let's see what kind of fields are there. Email. Yes. Thank you, TypeScript, for the suggestion. And right after I save the form, I have this email field. Let's try to put something in there. Is this an email? Oh, that's not a well formed email. This is a well formed email. Let's try to submit that. OK, now it was successful when I have the error, uh, not the error, just a notification. <laughs> uh, notification pop up uh, saying that I have submitted the data to the server. Great. Now, on to some more complicated use case 
um, that uh, I just also wanted to highlight here. Uh, let's say if we have a password name, uh, a password field, and we want to validate it with another password field, so so that the user, we show that the user can type the password twice and uh, uh, doesn't have any that mistakes uh, in that. Um, let's try somehow to enter. I I'm using text fields uh, for the sake of the presentation so that uh, uh, content is visible right away. I type some pass and I make some typo here. But it still accepts my incorrect password. We should definitely fix that. How are we going to fix that? uh we would need a validator and this time it's not a simple rule on the here on a, on a, on the entity because uh here i need to actually take both properties into account uh, both password and the password copy so that's a cross field validation use case and it's a little bit more complex than just uh, get, just uh, adding a, an annotation on my java entity for that, I would need to write the validator itself uh, and check uh, the person entity, uh, check both password and password copy. Uh, here, I'm just doing this in the client side on the server. Uh, it's going to be similar, in the, uh, similar structure. The validate method could uh, check if the entity has matching password and password copy and uh, output the error message in case of if, if a mismatch happens. Um, so that's my client side validator. That's what it does. Uh, this uh, is a simple structure, just a validate callback and the default message. This default message is not used in practice because we are uh, actually making a custom message here. And with this custom message, I indicate that I want it to show up in the password copy. And uh, if there are no mismatches, I don't say that I don't send any errors, so I return empty uh, error list from the validator. Uh, in order to apply it to my form, I need to take a validator method that is also returned by my use form hook. And uh, the small caveat here is that I need to only call add validator once, and I don't need to repeat it every time my view renders, so I'm going to use effect that only executes once here and uh, let me add this um what was the name password copy validator okay and now let's try again with some name i uh, got some email My passwords match, and now my passwords do not match because I can type something else. Now, if I type I, the F, in both places, now it is correct. Okay, what else can we do with this form? Oh, there, yeah, one idea is that we can also, we should be able to refill it with some initial data. If I refresh, I'll get the empty form here by default. What if I already have some person's data stored on the server? How do I get it back to my form and make uh, some kind of a profile edit form? Uh, for this use case, I can use the read method. And this one is going to, it, it takes the argument of a value person and it's going to initialize the form with uh, uh, the initial state and the initial values using this person. Again, I'm going to use uh, a one-time effect for that because I only need to initialize my form once and I don't need to do this all the times when uh, my view re-renders. Um, here, I can use my backend method. You recall, I have the backend that has some hard-coded data here. It returns the person entity for me. If I call the load person method, let's do just that. I load the person. And it's an async method. It returns a promise 
with React, it's a bit more uh, convenient if I'm not using a wait, but I just call them and then give it read callback. Yes, as simple as that, it's just enough. Let me save, and now the data appears right away in my view when I save the file. Okay, so that was about it, I guess. Anton, there yep. was what? Yeah, sorry, you can yep. go ahead. There was just a question about the uh, that there is a ticket about a bug in one two nine four uh, about the binder not the default value for nested uh, types. Uh, but I think, as far as I can tell, this is just uh, a bug that we will go to address in in a future, like a uh, next batch release. So, yes. Yeah. And there's also another question about the form binder and emphasize uh, that it is come. It came with Hilla 2.2. So if you're in an earlier version, you need to upgrade to Hilla 2.20 or later. All right. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So speaking of the missing things, uh, some things that are not yet there in the 2.0 release. Um, uh, first of all, you cannot yet fine tune how exactly the binding is done with the field on the DOM level. Uh, there's no. There's some binding strategies that I used internally, but there's no way to customize it and uh, uh, apply, integrate with, a, uh, let's say, some custom DOM component. Um, this works out of the box with Varden components. Uh, I mean, Hila components with React, <laughs> of course. And it works uh, with some limited features are working with the HTML, uh, inputs as well. Uh, obviously, the input is not going to, to show the error message, and that would be something that you would need to do on your own. Uh, or if you want a custom field, you can already use uh, uh, customize, uh, uh, let's say, a uh, Hilo React text field, uh, wrap it, and uh, use a custom wrapper with uh, done with React in the form binder. Then there is no convenient array uh, support for array forms. Uh, for example, uh, let's say if you have an order form that has multiple rows and the user can add another row uh, on the order for, let's say, like a shopping cart or something like that. This is coming in a future release. And uh, also, it's a known drag drawback that in order to localize the error messages, for now you would have to use the uh, lit based API directly. And there's no uh, uh, Accessors in the use form hook uh, for React. So that's about it uh, on the forms. But there's one more Hilo 2.0 feature that I want to mention here. It's the browser callable annotation. Uh, if you have noticed, if you're familiar with Hilo endpoints, instead of the endpoint, I was using browser callable here. And uh, this is basically a new alias. It works otherwise the same as the endpoint. And we just introduced this alias because we had the developer advocate feedback uh, about the endpoint name. People sometimes, when uh, we speak about endpoints, people are confusing them with REST endpoints and uh, something else. So we are trying to see if, if, uh, if this name is going to work better. Um, you would often make browser callable and service together. Uh, services, the Spring Boot annotation, uh, which to our, in our opinion, sounds descriptive and accurate. So uh, it's kind of a nice combination. But there are no deprecations yet, and you can still use endpoint. That's, that's a small note about browser callable. And now we get to the poll question number three. Yes, thanks, Anton. So once again, we would like to get your feedback about the form feature that Anton has just presented. And so if you go to the lower right corner, the poll tab, there is a question 
how helpful, if at all, is the new form support uh, in Hilla and React. So if you take a minute to choose one of the options there. I think maybe, Brian, you have shown the wrong question, <laughs> but... Or I am checking the wrong question. Okay, yeah, so the found most of them said not, most of the answers are not sure, or it's somewhat helpful, very helpful. So between very helpful, not sure, or somewhat helpful. So, all right. So thank you for, for this feedback. And uh, Anton, please yeah, continue with the next topic of native compilation. OK, so that's the second topic in our webinar, native compilation. And that this has not so much to do with the UIs, but more to do with how the applications are deployed. Um, basically, uh, this is introducing a native image compilation feature in Hila. And what this is, is, is that's a way to uh, compile your Java application into a standalone native binary uh, image or binary executable file, if that's more familiar. And uh, why you would want to do that? Uh, because uh, this is going to work much faster than with uh, uh, how, how Java applications are normally deployed. It starts, uh, the startup time is reduced significantly, more than 10 times usually. And the memory footprint is also decreased just by a few times just by running this ahead of time compilation process. And they, the ahead of time compiler uh, we support is uh, Graal VM. It's the requires Graal VM SDK. And uh, the process is, uh, Scanning the entire jar and trying to reach all the code and inline it to a native file. Um, then uh, this is something supported by Hilo 2, and uh, Spring Boot has introduced its own support in the version 3. So make sure to upgrade to Hilo 2 in order to use that. Uh, we have some documentation in Hilo Docs about this feature, uh, and there's also a great uh, guide in uh, Spring Boot reference. Uh, check that out. Uh, without further words, let's see how it works in, in Hilo. So first, let me reuse the same application. I need to uh, interrupt the development mode here. OK. Clear a lot of messages. Um, the essence is that if you compile to production using this magic command, uh, dash p production, dash p mate is native compile. This is using native Maven plugin. Uh, then uh, what this is going to do is that it's going to run a long process, which will first compile your jar. And then run it with Graal VM ahead of time compiler. That's going to scan uh, the entire code and try to reach uh, uh, every branch and whatnot, uh, every destination in the code path and inline everything to native code. And this usually takes a while, so I'm not going to uh, wait for a few minutes. Let's see. There's, uh, I have already run this before the presentation, and we can now just uh, try launching this app. Uh, first, uh, in order to have some ba baseline for comparison, let's try to take this jar and uh, uh, run it with time. It's uh, been time minus pal. And then the regular command Java jar project. So that's the regular, so like the JVM development thing. I don't need the browser, I can close it. Um, as you can see, my application was starting for the four and a half seconds. So that's quite a lot. 
And if I interrupt it right now, when it has just started, it has already used uh, almost 300 megabytes, 270 something megabytes of memory. So it has a large memory footprint of uh, JVM and all the classes, everything. And if I try to do the, to launch the same application compiled to the native executable, and uh, actually I don't need the Java part, I can just launch it natively. There it is. Bam. It started in 0 0.1 seconds, so 40 times faster. 30 times faster, something like that, than the JVM executable startup. And I have this message from my operating system because that's a new binary and it wants to access the network. So this is fine. Yes. And uh, if I just interrupt it to see the memory footprint, the memory is just 18x. So it went down over three times just by running the ahead of time compiler. So that's really great for deployment. That would be really beneficial if you deploy on the cloud and if you want to uh, start your application only when somebody is using it and shut down it to save on the deployment cost. Uh, yeah, and uh, of course it's a native application, but there is an option to compile using uh, using Docker to build a Docker image and uh, deploy it that way. Um, then one thing to mention is that currently I had to use a workaround in this application to get the to get the native compiler to work, and that's because there's a a known issue in in Vadin flow that uh, brings the dependency that uh, uh, introduces a class that confuses the native compiler analysis process. So. Luckily, this is something that is only used in build time and uh, the HTTP client and flow is used for things like downloading missing tools, downloading node and NPM for the developer in case of it's missing. So this, this is not something that is going to affect production at all. And that's quite safe to just uh, exclude this uh, common plugin dependency that creates a problem uh, from the flow server artifact. And this issue has already been fixed in the recent development version, but uh, is not yet backported. So please watch for this ticket and uh, uh, follow this. Or yeah, feel free to also use this workaround for now. And that's about it about the native image. Now I give the mic, mic to Tarek. Uh, talk about uh, the Kilo roadmap. Thank you, Anton. And let me share my screen. Da -da -da. Yes. All right. So yeah, I just we wanted to conclude briefly with few uh, notices, or like just like share with you some of the information of the thing about some of the things that we're thinking about developing in the upcoming weeks and months for, for Hilla. And uh, one thing to note is that our long-term vision for Hilla is for it to be the go-to framework for full-stack Java development of, of business apps on top of Java and TypeScript. Like, uh, so today, however, Hilla, although today Hilla only supports Spring Boot in the back end and, and it supports React and Lit on the front end, uh, we in the long term, we we hope to be able to support more technology stacks related to Java and TypeScript in in, in both places. So support to other than uh, than Spring Boot, uh, Quarkus, Jakarta, and so on, and and also other than React and Lit. We we look forward to support uh, Vue and Angular and other uh, front end frameworks as well. But for the short term, our short term objective is to focus on. Uh, making sure that React, uh, sorry, Hilla is uh, is the very uh, enabled people to be very productive, specifically on the Spring Boot and React stack. So for the short term, um, at least until the end of the year, our aim is to make people using Hilla 
with Spring Boot and React to be multiple times more productive using Hilla compared to using uh, Spring Boot and React alone. And towards this objective, we identified some of the areas that we are considering to improve for Hilla in order to make it much easier to work with it and to enable people to be developers to be much more productive with it. And I'm sharing this with you, not to say that these things are set in stone, but just to as a way to invoke or or ask you to for your feedback about these things, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, which areas are are the areas that you think that uh, you would benefit the most from seeing Hella developing its capabilities in. So we have crowd views, and I have a couple of slides on crowd views that I'll share with you. But basically, it's about making it easier to create crowds and forms in Hella. And we know that these are the like workhorses of business apps. And so it would be very good if Hella can offer unique opportunities there. And I show a couple of examples there. There's also the issue of extendable prototypes or how enabling developers to quickly from some backend models to quickly generate uh, initial prototypes views of based on these models uh, without having to write so much code. But importantly, these prototypes have to be extendable or customizable. So it can just not just some generated code that is is like that people will get stuck with, but they have to be adjustable as well. And there are other also improvements that we, we are some of which we have started already related to security, authorization, access control. There are things also simplifications related to routing and uh, making it easier for testing, error handling, and internationalization as well. But very briefly, the CRUD helpers, because this is the thing that we have already started developing today. And uh, as I say, that, that as I said before, that our goal is to make enable Hilla to simplify. We believe that Hilla can simplify the process of building different type of CRUD views, CRUDs and forms. And the opportunity here that Hilla has a unique opportunity being this full stack framework with its full stack architecture enables it to use the metadata from the backend uh, to provide good starting point for rendering UIs that you can then uh, customize later on. And just to very briefly just give a couple of example of how, examples of how this might look like. Uh, so let's assume that one wants to create this kind of crowd view. So this is just a grid with a table with a launch of rows and you have an edit column and you can of course start editing the component. This is inline editing, but you can also imagine that it could be like sort of a master detail view or it could be a dialogue. When you click on a row, you open a dialogue. So it, it should be like offering these different kinds of supports. But let's say we one wants to do this and you have filtering on the top and this whole thing is lazy loaded for efficiency and so on. So our vision that one thing that we can do, uh, and these are just uh, like initial ideas about possible APIs. So one thing, for example, if we have an endpoint that uh, for the sake of prototyping that you can uh, pass return uh, access to uh, say here, we are returning access to find all uh, from the repository. So we have a person repository and we are uh, retrieving uh, the find all uh, uh, method from this repository to the through a hell endpoint. Then from the front end, it will be a matter of a one line that would enable one to create a read only filterable and sortable lazy loaded uh, grid. So that's for for the read. That's perhaps the simplest possible starting point for for those CRUD helpers, what we call CRUD helpers. But perhaps one can also think of a bit more advanced point. Perhaps one this is not that one would have uh, an interface to implement. So Hilla would provide its own interface. So Hilla CRUD endpoint, and this interface would you can hook to your service, and then. Uh, it will include all the methods that you would override needed to, op uh, to perform CRUD operations, count, creation, delete, update, and like find all, of course, uh, and, and save. And then from the front end, like creating this grid that we saw before, uh, the CRUD uh, that, that enables CRUD operation will be just a matter of having uh, this one line that you pass in the front end, that you have this passed auto uh, uh, the, the endpoint uh, to the front end, and uh, this will automatically give you this ready-made uh, CRUD in the uh, in the front end. 
And of course, as to emphasize again, this is good starting point, but importantly, these kind of helpers, this kind of new components for uh, for CRUD operations have to be customizable. So we one which should have be able to customize the number of columns, their visibility, orders, formatting, and so on. Uh, it's important also to customize the filtering process. Like in the example I showed, the filtering was on the top of the columns, but perhaps one wants to have the filtering outside of, of the grid altogether. One should be able to customize the form layout that enables the editing, uh, exclude specific properties from being shown, sending DTO types instead of the uh, actual GPA entities to the client, and also customizing uh, how the raw data is, is presented and many other possible customizations as well. So again, this is just one area that we started with working with, but there are other things that, other areas of improvement in Hilla that we are looking to, to work on in the future. Uh, this include again, extendable prototypes, authorization access control, routing, testing, error handling, and internationalization. And before going to your questions, just one final poll. Uh, which of these areas would you most like us to focus on for Hilla uh, in the upcoming weeks? And and you can believe choose as many. Yeah, you can select several of these if you want. So if you again, please go to the polling tab in the bottom right corner and select things that are relevant to you. All right, improvements to authorization and access control is so far in the top, followed by UI components and CRUD helpers in the third place and documentation and internationalization tying. No, actually, it's moving now. Okay, so testing, internationalization, routing, and extendable prototypes is, is at the bottom of the list. All right, many thanks for, for the feedback on this. And uh, with that, I just want to very briefly mention uh, our next steps specifically that we have just released Hilla 2.2 and we have form binding and validation uh, for React there. We have also uh, provided a better documentation for uh, our React components. So if you go now to hilla.dev, you'll see that the React component documentation with extensive examples are, are listed there. Hilla 2.3 is coming, scheduled to come in October 18th, and we are currently working on CRUD helpers, as well as we are working on simplifications for security and routing. Tentatively, we were thinking of working on extendable prototypes or code generations for Hilla 2.4, although now I see the, the popularity of, these, uh, of this area is not so high, so maybe we have to reconsider this uh, aspect. Uh, thanks for the feedback. And in Hilla 2.5, we will also uh, we are considering uh, further enhancements to authentication and authorization, and possibly also uh, easier error handling. That was the last slide, and I just wanted to. There was a couple of questions, uh, a couple of which we an answered uh, already. But uh, one question to you, perhaps Anton, related to forms: Is it possible to handle? non-standard bean or even cross-field validations so that you can define the logic in the Java backend and generate the corresponding type, TypeScript? Uh, well, there is a, there are limits, of course, of your, what you can do. For the non-standard bean, uh, cross-validation, uh, cross-field validations, uh, something that Hila can help you with is that if you define this logic in Java, not declaratively, but just imperatively validating something, and uh, you have the error for the form, then Hila can show it in the form. So that's that's about uh, the limitation of how we can help uh, with this use case. We don't have, uh, at the moment, we don't have any uh, declarative, uh, like uh, complex annotations in Java supported uh, somehow. Magically, just the standard set of uh, JSR three hundred three. But customized validation would work in the backend only, right? Uh, yes, yes. So you would you would need to validate the data in the backend, and we can show the backend error on the on the front end in the form. So 
that's it. And of course, with, if you want to do the early feedback thing, then uh, uh, that requires just a moment of implementation on both the back end and the client side for your cross yeah. validation or complex validation. Yeah. And the follow up like, comment uh, here is that maybe we can, Hella can offer some hooks to extend the Java TypeScript compiler. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was something on our mind. We have, uh, uh, like, this is possible with the code structure we have right now, but at the moment, there's no documentation on how to do this. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's a, it's a good suggestion. It's the yeah. second time we hear it in, in two weeks, actually. Uh, yeah. So it is something that we should document, at least, yeah. Yeah, please feel free to... Uh, submit an issue or a GitHub discussion and write this uh, yeah. somehow so that, uh, yeah, it is visible that it's something that our community wants. Yeah. It, it, this is going to help us prioritize this on our roadmap. Hmm. And the question maybe from product management perspective for Hilla, it seems that you favor React over Lit now. Do you think React is better than Lit for building client side application? Or is, it, or is it just about uh, to attract the React community? Uh, we support, we can, we support and we continue to support, we will continue to support both React and Lit uh, in Hilla. Uh, we do actually, yes, uh, make more effort into improving React uh, experience, A, because it was less than uh, Let's So for example, uh, form, by form binding wasn't in React before it was a let, so now both are on equal footing. Uh, having said that, also, yes, there is, of course, uh, a much more people who are uh, interested and are using React than let. I don't think we don't have any preferences like which is better, uh, but I think like many people do prefer using React, and that is also reflected in the number of people who are using Hilla today, most of which whom are using Hilla with React. Yes, so I can share with, like, on this topic that defining better here is uh, not really, like, it, it, it's not black and white, and it's a complex uh, category, so. Uh, React is a little bit better when it comes to developer experience and when it comes to preserving developer resources and getting uh, front-end developers more productive, I believe, because uh, you have better support for tooling. Um, you have more like higher-level concepts built into the framework. And Lit is better for the technical performance standpoint. You get the smaller bundle and you get uh, the browser that runs faster with your client-side code. So. Just pick what is better for you. Yeah. And there was a, another question. I mean, that wasn't completely related to the topic, but asking whether it is possible to customize the look and feel and the size, say, and color of Hilla components. And the answer is yes, absolutely. This is possible. And this is already, there is a styling guide in our documentation on how you can do this. And one final, or maybe it's not final, let's see. There's, but also question for other technology stacks other than React and Lit. And perhaps I mentioned this. Uh, yes, we hope in the future to, to support these other technology stacks like Vue and Angular. But in the short term, for 2023 at least, we will focus on making Hilla works, work really well, for especially for React, uh, for Spring Boot and React stack, before considering expanding for uh, our support to other uh, to other technology stacks as well. Uh, I believe those are all the questions. I cannot see any more. Yes, those are all the questions. So thank you all again for your participations and, and question. And uh, again, the slides will be sent to you and uh, we hope that you have found some uh, useful tips here and important thing if you have any suggestions or criticisms or feedback to us please do share it in the discord uh, sorry in the discord channel but also in, in github as well open tickets and discussions there thank you all and have a good day hope to see you again thank you see you